John Prisabella from Walpert is going to talk about practical considerations on integrating BIM models, building information models, with GIS. John. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk really about something we really haven't spent much time talking about here, which is the vertical design world, the, the architectural design parameter. And we're going to start by talking about what that world is today. The, the vertical design process, that is a practice of architecture, is very much constrained, uh, constrained by law, constrained by, by precedent in the industry, uh, obviously a very old industry. And in terms of the, uh, the constraints in law, for instance, many of you are from Massachusetts. Massachusetts allows in their state law a design, bid, build projects, design, build projects, CM at risk projects, all number of different d integrated delivery methods for owners to acquire buildings from the design and construction community. The state of Ohio, uh, I live in Ohio, does only allows one of those methods, the design, bid, build world. Now, uh, if any of you are Mark Twain scholars, you know that, that Mark Twain said, if, if the world's going to come to an end, uh, I, I want to be in Cincinnati, because it'll happen 20 years later there than anywhere else. <laughs> uh, it, it may be more than 20 years in the case of this, this scenario. But uh, be that as it may, that, that whole issue, uh, as, 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 uh, as funny as that seems, that whole issue is one of the most important issues when we're talking about something like how do we implement a, a geodesign process in the world uh, that architects live in? Because the world that architects live in is not at all uniform. And those issues, those issues of integrated delivery methods, really define in many ways what, what the processes are, what the business processes are, and then those business processes define or constrain what can be done in terms of a geodesign process. So that, uh, with that as a starting point, Moving on to the technical side of the arena, there's a technology called BIM. I'm sure everybody here knows uh, that BIM is building information modeling. And, and BIM is the tool of choice for vertical design. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean all designs that are being done for buildings today are, are BIM. Uh, probably only about half of them are today uh, by the various practitioners in the industry. That's going to change, and it's, it's changing very quickly. Within a few years, that number will, will rise to a, a large majority of buildings. But, but BIM is the technology we're talking about because it's the technology of the future for sure. And the BIM community, which is a community that was originally really a series of software vendors, developed a, a series of standards to, talk, to allow information between their various products to communicate. And, and that standard is, is known as industry foundation classes. It is becoming an ISO standard. It is an extremely rich and extremely verbose standard. It defines everything having to do with the physical characteristics of the building, the spaces of the buildings, the uh, connectivity of all those elements, the things like schedules, costs, actors, uh, uh, almost all of the things that you can think about that relate to a building and the way it is built and operated are contained within the IFC standard. That makes this standard incredibly big and rich and verbose, so much so that almost nobody can actually handle it. <clears throat> so it creates its own problem by being so rich. It's a very different approach than the GIS community has taken. The GIS community has said, here are some basic elements, and you, as the developer of your GIS, you go out and use those elements to develop a structure any way you want. It's incredibly open-ended, as opposed to the BIM community, which said, we're going to build a closed-end standard that defines everything. The advantage of the closed-end standard is that means when we want to trade data back and forth, all those things will be, will be known and defined. So if I'm a developer of a software product for BIM design, I can be confident that the software products that do quantity takeoff, that do uh, 4D, schedule, 4D and 5D scheduling, that do uh, a myriad of things, energy analysis, all those products will be able to take my data and use it and give me back the results that I want because we've already agreed on the data interchange down to a very, very discreet level. So again, BIM community has taken one direction. The GIS community has taken a different direction. And both directions work, and both directions are, are appropriate for the communities. The, GIS community has developed a nominal design standard in effect for interior facility, for buildings, for facilities, and it's called the Building and, Informa Building and Interior Spaces Data Model. 
that project, that work, has now been published and it's out on the uh, ESRI website. So those are the, that's the starting point. When we talk about what do we want to do in terms of geodesign with BIM and GIS, we step, try to step back and talk about what are the use cases. And there are many use cases in the, in the uh, idea lab uh, that I chair. That group met yesterday, of course we're meeting today, and we started talking about some of these things. I, I worked up this slide long before that group met, so that group has, has taken this large, uh, largely beyond where, we start, where I started uh, when we started thinking about this, but some of the basic use cases to, to view the BIM or view the model in the context of the surrounding facilities. So if you look at the, the middle uh, graphic over on the right, that is, uh, I think that's downtown Cleveland. That's data taken from LIDAR, uh, captured electronically and, and morphed into uh, uh, 3D models. If I'm going to place a new building somewhere in downtown Cleveland, then I want to know what's, what's around me. How is it going to impact those buildings? What am I going to be able to see? The, uh, the graphic below that is a graphic of some view sheds from various locations in downtown Cleveland. And if I'm going to, again, if I'm going to have to place a new 50-story building in downtown Cleveland, I'm not sure how I'm going to get the money to do that, but let's assume I could, um, then I, I want to know how those view sheds are going to be impacted by that new building. Uh, so viewing those, analyzing those impacts of, of the surroundings, uh, uh, is, is probably the key or one of the key use cases for integrating BIM and GIS. Another use case is a, is a use case to hand over the BIM at the end of the design and construction process to the owner for facility management. And that's what the BISDEM model uh, largely deals with is the facility at the end of the design and construction process, the owner is going to absorb that information into their GIS so they can maintain that facility over its life cycle. And then there are many other use cases. So what are some of the integration issues if we, if, we, if we use those use cases as our premise? What are some of the integration issues? Well, first is that a, a BIM model is much, much richer in detail than a GIS database. Uh, the BIM model will include everything from the, the, the screws necessary to hold the, the joist to a, uh, to a column. And together those things, that level of detail is much, much higher than you want in your GIS. The BIM contain, contain, excuse me, contains all the information needed to construct the building, but not the information necessary to manage it. And there's a bunch of information that relates to the management that is supplied by a standard called COBE, which is another emerging standard coming out of the BIM field. COBE was developed by NASA and the Corps of Engineers, and it involves adding data at the planning stage, the design stage, and the construction stage, so that together, all that information is available to the building owner and, and that the data is structured much like the data in the BISDEM model. It includes facility information, floor information, space information, and so on. And, and if we're really going to put together a, a, a BIM world and a GIS world, we need to look at COBE as a part of that equation, not just the BIM, the data out of the model, but the BIM model, but the data out of COBE. Together, those things can form the, the information necessary for the GIS, but then we've got to pull a subset out of that because in our GIS all we want is the subset. But there are some real constraints. Uh, exports from IFC are very problematic. Uh, there are really no tools to migrate the COBE data into, uh, into GIS right now. And, and frankly, much of that data doesn't even belong in the GIS. So we've got a, a lot of sorting out to do. Uh, in addition to that, we've got the whole issue of if we're going to take GIS and move it to BIM, uh, really it's a whole other topic. Uh, we've got to define those use cases, we've got to define the model constraints, and we've got to look at what, the tool, what tools we have to do that. So, thank you. Yeah, this integration between specific buildings and context that GIS represents, uh, I mean, it, it's going to be challenging, and there are active efforts to do this, as you know. Uh, I'm always challenged by the notion that I want to be able to fly in, get out of my airplane, walk across the campus, open the door of the building, walk in, go to a particular room, blah, 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 blah. And that, that's actually the, the dream. And, and being able to do analytics and all of it at the same time calls for 
integration of these two data environments, and there are some both theoretical and also technical challenges that we're going to face. 